On this video, we will be looking at probability and goodness of fit and how to use this while approaching various genetic problems. So when we deal with probability and goodness of fit, genetic ratios are most properly expressed as probability. For example, you may have three-fourths tall, one-fourth short, which is a predicted outcome of each fertilization, not that if you have four offsprings that three-fourths will be tall and one-fourth will be short. It's with each offspring. Each offspring has a 75% chance of being tall and a 25% chance of being short. Probability can range from zero being not a chance at all, where an event is certain and uh, not to occur, or one, which represents 100%, where an event is certain to occur. So when we deal with uh, two independent non-genetic events, we can look at the product law and we can look at the sum law. The product law holds that the probability of two independent events occurring simultaneously is the product of the event's independent, uh, independent probability. The sum law holds that the probability of one or the other of the two events occurs is the sum of the uh, individual probabilities. Let's look at an example. If two coins are tossed simultaneous, each has a one-half chance of landing on heads and a one-half chance of landing on tails. The probability of two heads would be one-fourth because the probability um, of one head is one-half plus the probability of the other which would be one half, resulting in one fourth. The probability of tails for both would be one fourth. The probability of one head and one tail would be one fourth for head tails, one fourth for tail heads, or one half. Now an important note to remind you is that when you're dealing with probability and predictions of possible outcomes, or our theoretical calculations, these are usually realized only with large samples. Any deviation from that predicted ratio is because the sample size is too small. And we have seen this occur with our Drosophilus fly uh, in that we had uh, a small number of um, offsprings. And so because we had uh, a number of offsprings under a thousand, it didn't always match up to our theoretical calculations. Now, if we were to look at the two uh, coins that are tossed for, say, 50 tosses, simple assumptions about the coins, coins must first be made before the probabilities are calculated. First, the coins must be unbiased, constructed physically so that each coin has an equal chance of landing on heads and an equal chance of landing on tails. The coins are tossed independently of each other. Um, does the coin, each coin toss, have an equal chance of coming up to heads or to tails? And each toss event is independent of the previous uh, tosses. The binomial theorem can be used to predict the outcome of a number of coin tosses or a number of genetic crosses. The binomial formula is a plus b to the nth power equals 1. For example, in 100 coin tosses, coins will be either heads or tails. The probability of being heads, and we'll put heads as A, equals 1 half. The probability of being tails, and we'll put tails as being B, is 1 half. N equals 4 because 4 coins were tossed. It doesn't say that in the, the problem here, but we'll say that we tossed 4 coins. So that in this example, we have A plus uh, B to the fourth equals one. We expand that out, A to the fourth plus four A cubed B plus six A squared B squared plus four A B cubed plus B four. So we have our problem set up and for A, everywhere we see A, we'll put one half. Everywhere where we see B, we'll put one half. Mathematically, we'll work it out so that we would end up with one. And you can look through the problem and see that. Uh, now here we have the binomial expansion and um, so we've got these forms and so you can see how uh, we expand it out where we have a plus b to the o, um, a plus b1, uh, a plus b squared 
uh, a plus b cubed we have that worked out you may have seen one of these charts which is how we did that um, in uh, a math class so here we would have 0 1 2 3 4 we would have a to the fourth 4 a 3 b 6 a squared b squared 4 a b cubed and then b to the fourth so what we do here is this right here shows us the numbers that go in front and then uh, we start off with our a at the highest so a to the fourth then it would be a to the third a to the second a and then no a and then we start off with uh, b is zero and then we would have b, uh, b one b squared b cubed and b to the fourth so you may have seen that in math now what this works out as is uh, in a genetics problem if we were to say we were to have um, two children and let me pause and just put a problem here for a second so i put a little problem here and we'll just do a simple tall short so we're going to cross a heterozygous tall with a heterozygous tall if we did the punit square this would be what we have in the punit square or big t big t big t little t big t little t little t little t so tall we would have three fourths being tall short we would have one fourth being short um, a family wants to have five children and um, the five children they have they have three that are tall and two are the short what is the likelihood of this happening so what we would have to do is come down zero one two three four five we're going to use this expansion right there we'll just kind of circle that one in there and so that that is this right here okay already expanded out and so what we're looking at is we want to see um, three tall and two short now we're going to say that um, tall equals a and we'll say short equals b and so when we look at this we see right right here that we have um, three tall and two short and so to get the likelihood we would take 10 times one uh, i'm sorry three fourths we'll erase that and put three fourths cubed times one half squared and that would be our answer and so that's how we can use the binomial expression in uh, a genetics problem so uh, again a man with ptosis uh, whose father uh, displayed the trait but whose mother did not display the trait so he's a carrier marries a female that's normal uh, if they have four children, what is the probability of three of those being normal and one having ptosis? So the man is heterozygous. He's big P, little p. The mother is little p, little p. We do the cross and uh, we end up with this right here is my F1, where they would have, it looks like, uh, we'll say A is ptosis. It looks like they have a half a chance of having ptosis. And then B is not ptosis. So they have a half a cha uh, chance of not having ptosis. The problem states that they want to have three normal children that do not have ptosis and one child that has ptosis. What is the likelihood of this occurring? And so we're going to uh, move down. We're going to use this right here because they have four children and we are looking at three having ptosis which is uh, a to the third and one not so we're going to look at this right here because three having ptosis one does not so we would multiply four times the a is one half it's cubed and then the b is one half and it's not cubed we multiply this right here out and then that would be our answer if you do the math you end up with a 0.25 or a one in four chance that is that if they have four children three will be normal and one would have ptosis here we have another example um, each of the individuals heterozygous uh, the couple wants to marry they have four children the probability of three being normal 
one having pitosis, we can use that same equation. Now, because they're heterozygous, so they're big, uh, big P, little p, the F1 would be it looks like three-fourths B and A and then you would have um, one-fourth being B and then we would go back into our chart we would still use um, this right here because three children having the condition and one children not so we would multiply four times in this case a is three-fourths cubed uh, B is one-fourth it is not cubed work this right here out and we would have our answer now as we do genetics there are a few terms for you to go through uh, population is an interbreeding group of, of the same species gene pool is the collection of all the alleles uh, in the members of the population population genetics is the study of the genetics of a population and how the genes vary from time to time. Gene flow is the movement of the genes. Remember allele and gene, same, same terms. Uh, the movement of the genes between populations when people migrate and mate. So that when we calculate allele frequencies, allele frequency equals the number of particular alleles divided by the total number of alleles in the population. Um, if you are looking at one person, they will have two alleles because they have one from mom, one from dad. If you're looking at total number of alleles in a population of, say, 15 people, then you would have 30 alleles you're looking at because they receive one from the, uh, one parent, one from the other parent. Here we have some of the frequencies, the various traits that you can see. This is tasting PKU. That's that nasty paper that I have you taste in class and then laugh at when you taste. So you can see uh, the likelihood of individuals tasting it. Uh, it's a little bit more uh, frequent in individuals who are of Turkish descent. And um, if you are of Japanese descent, you're less likely to be able to taste this particular paper. And do remember that when we talk about uh, probability with relation to genetics, many times they're going to bring in the word evolution. All of these calculations that we're doing are evolutionary calculations, but they are microevolution calculations. In other words, they're calculations of adaptations of species within the environment. They have nothing to do with one species changing into another species. And so we are okay doing these calculations because we are just looking at how animals adapt to environment through their genes. We are not by any means looking at evolution going on in the sense that one species changes to another. So what we are looking at is acceptable in both the secular scientific world and as Christian scientists. So when we look at the microevolution or adaptation, we're looking at the small genetic changes due to changes in the gene frequency in the population. Uh, this can happen because we have non-random mating. Um, the uh, species will mate non-randomly. That means that they, they don't pick who they run across. You know, a, a bobcat is not going to pick between 15 different bobcats. It's going to run across whichever one it meets. Uh, migration, the fact that the animals move around. Genetic drift, the changes in the allele population. Random mutations that occur. And natural selection. Some animals will get sick and die and others will survive.